Welcome to the third episode of Thin Air. Just a heads up, this story is a two-parter, and this is the second part. If you haven't listened to the first part, stop now, go listen to it, and then come back. This episode will make so much more sense if you do that. Also, this story can be pretty graphic at times when describing acts of child abuse and murder. So, if any of you are sensitive to that kind of material, please proceed with caution. On our last episode, Jordan told the story of Marie Ann Watson, a mother of two who vanished under mysterious circumstances from Emmett, Idaho in 1977. On this episode, Jordan covers the 1996 investigation of the case after Raymond Rogers is arrested in California on charges of triple homicide. Previously, on Thin Air. Dorothy, uh, Dorothy made the statement to the police at the time that she saw her get into a black unknown type of car with some what she described as shady characters and they drove off west out of town and they never saw her again. That she was just gone. She was just gone. In a 1989 paper written by psychiatrist Bessel van der Kolk, a pioneering researcher into post-traumatic stress disorder, he discusses how trauma, sexual, physical, or emotional, affects the childhood mind and leads to a reenactment of the trauma as an adult. In a study discussed in the paper, 14 juvenile boys sentenced to death were studied, and it was found that 12 of them, that's almost 90%, had been brutally physically abused as young children. In other words, if you're exposed to trauma as a child, you're likely to, as you get older, recreate similar trauma. It's an idea that makes intuitive sense. You hear stories of cyclical abuse. A child is beaten, he grows up to be an abuser. Van der Kolk's paper posits many different reasons for this, specifically that child victims feel powerless and overwhelmed, and as adults, they regain a sense of control and power by becoming what they feared as children. In our last episode, we told the story of the disappearance of Marie Watson, a mother of two who went missing during a custody battle in Emmett, Idaho. Children are at the heart of this story. There are Marie's, Sarah and John, not their real names, and the Rogers adopted children, five of them. That seven children growing up together in a home that many regarded as traumatic, with the children suffering physical and sexual abuse at the hands of Michael and Dorothy Rogers. In our last episode, we interviewed Detective Tom Nesbitt, and he described Mike and Dorothy and what they were like at length. And I think that's what was going on in that in that home. I had lots of evidence that you know there was a lot of sexual activity amongst the children, and. I think that those two grew up that way. I think that they're products mm-hmm. of the same thing they passed on. You got to be careful with them because their laws don't apply to them. Mm-hmm. You know, the world doesn't apply to them. Right. And I don't believe that they have any fear of dying or being locked away. Nesbitt is candid when describing them, believing the Rogers guilty of the worst crimes imaginable, child abuse, satanic sacrificing, and the murder of Marie Watson, the woman who disappeared in 1977, leaving her two children behind in the custody of Michael and Dorothy. The children who grew up in the home, who we discussed in our last episode, all ended up in different places after Michael and Dorothy were captured in Arkansas by a PI named Burr. Sarah and John were adopted by their grandparents and lived in Kansas after this. The rest of the Rogers adopted children and what became of them are the next piece of the Marie Watson story, which remained a cold case until 1996, 19 years after she went missing in 1977. That's when Raymond Rogers, the oldest of the Rogers adopted children, was arrested in San Diego, California, the perpetrator of a grisly triple homicide. If children really do grow up to repeat the traumas of their past, the murders Raymond was accused and charged with made investigators ask, exactly what manner of suffering did Raymond endure at the hands of Michael and Dorothy? Did it change him into a serial killer? And did he witness the murder of Marie Watson by his parents? Police thought so, and they also thought that Marie's body, or at least fragments of it, could be buried in a cold grave on the Rogers property just waiting to be discovered. This is the 1996 case of Raymond Rogers and how the Marie Watson investigation got a new life back in Emmett thanks to Detective Nesbitt, the FBI, and a warrant that allowed for an extensive dig on the Rogers property. (laughs) 
It's 1996, San Diego, California. Raymond Rogers is different than the small town boy who grew up in Emmett, Idaho. He's made a name for himself in San Diego as a sort of jack of all trades. He works at various times as a window tinter, a drummer for a heavy metal band, and even was a manager of an apartment complex. He was also an actor, cast in small commercials and reenactment bits. There's even a clip of him playing a gang member in the show Crime Stoppers. People in Raymond's life describe him as charismatic, well liked, smart. He had a series of headshots taken, some close up with a wide, posed smile. There's a series of glamour shots, very model like. Being popular was nothing new for Raymond. Back in Emmett, growing up, he was well-known in the community as a good kid. At Emmett High School, where he graduated from, his yearbook shows the same smile, the same jet-black fluffy hair as his headshot. His name in the yearbook reads, Raymond J. Black Betty Rogers. His senior quote reads, The world is such a dangerous place to live in. One will be lucky if he gets out alive. A quote attributed to W.C. Fields, the famous vaudeville comedian and actor. He was both president and secretary of Emmett High Science Club, he was the wrestling team captain, and he did cross country and played baseball. All of these things, despite the fact that his home life was tumultuous at best, growing up with foster parents Michael and Dorothy Rogers. In their home, he was exposed to physical and sexual abuse, but it's not something he has ever spoken about or even officially confirmed as happening to him. At the time of Marie Watson's disappearance, Raymond was 17. As we described in our first episode, the last time Marie was seen was after driving to Ontario, Oregon in Raymond's car, a 1969 Ford Galaxy 500, which was borrowed by his foster mother, Dorothy. He knew Marie and knew her children, living with them in the Rogers home. Raymond ran away shortly after her disappearance for reasons that are unclear. A news report, years later, said he was afraid to go home. He lived with a different foster family until he graduated. After high school, Raymond joined the Navy and traveled all over the world, ending up in San Diego. There, he had lots of friends, lots of girlfriends. He got around. People knew him. He was successful in many of his ventures, becoming an apartment manager of the Saranac Bluff Apartments, where he lived. He moved there around 1992. This is when people in Raymond Rogers' life start going missing. First, there was a man named Ron, who Raymond knew in the Navy. They were close friends. After a contentious meeting with Raymond one night in 1993, Ron disappears and is never seen again. Then, in December of 1993, a former girlfriend of Raymond's, named Rose, goes missing shortly after telling Raymond that she's pregnant with his child. Raymond is the last person to see her until her partial remains are found in a trash bag on the side of the road. Cut to February 11th, 1996. A woman named Beatrice knocks on Raymond Rogers' door, suitcase in hand. She's traveled from Warsaw, Poland to live with Raymond. They met in Poland when Raymond was in the Navy and he was stationed there. They had a son named Nicholas together. A few months before Beatrice arrives in San Diego, Raymond had flown to Poland and taken Nicholas, disagreeing with the way Beatrice was raising him. There's no information about how this went down exactly, other than Nicholas ends up in San Diego without his mother, Beatrice. So then Beatrice follows to San Diego. According to court documents, Raymond had a different girlfriend at the time who had to move out because of Beatrice's arrival, something prosecutors would later call motive. The last time she was seen alive was one week later, on February 18th, 1996, which coincidentally is her birthday. Court documents do not say who was the last person to see her alive. One month later, police have been investigating Beatrice's disappearance, despite the fact that Raymond never filed a missing persons report for her. Police enter Raymond's storage unit, a section of three which are underneath his apartment. What they find in those storage units is not Beatrice, not exactly. Instead, they found pieces of Beatrice. I'll read from the court case, quote, The police seized a number of items from those rooms, including a tote bag containing Beatrice's driver's license, her luggage containing clothing and personal items, and a yellow bucket containing what proved to be her ten severed fingers and parts of her jaw with some teeth attached as well as some loose teeth. Other items seized included female clothing and underwear that were cut apart, a butcher knife with Beatrice's blood and hair, a blue tarp with red stains and hair, and a handsaw stained with blood and biological matter. End quote. 
Another piece of damning evidence found in the storage room was a pair of latex surgical gloves with both Beatrice's blood on them and Raymond's fingerprints inside. The court document goes on to list further evidence found in these storage units, but these are the most incriminating. Raymond is arrested and charged with Beatrice's murder. This arrest triggered an investigation, and he was later charged with the murder of his friend Ron and his former girlfriend Rose, who we talked about earlier. The gruesome details of the Raymond Rogers case and his status as a serial killer made investigators look into Raymond's past, back in Emmett, back to the mystery of the disappearance of Marie Ann Watson. As San Diego police began making phone calls, the case file of Marie Watson was sitting on the desk of Detective Tom Nesbitt, then of the Gem County Police Department. The old sheriff, Mark John, it was kind of mandatory for him. I want you to reopen all the old homicides or all the old missing persons and see if there's anything new you can come up with that we can close these cases with. And he wanted that done every six months. And so that's what we were doing, mm -hmm. and I just happened out of the blue, the next one in line was Marie Watson. And so I actually had that case file on my desk and I had done two interviews when my phone rang and it was detective from San Diego. So Nesbitt gets the call as he's looking into the Marie Watson case, which by all accounts had hit a dead end. As Nesbitt described in our last episode, the original investigators didn't take Marie's disappearance seriously, assuming she just left town. They were also afraid to question Michael Rogers, an imposing man who threatened police when questioned. What remained of the case left Nesbitt with very little to go on. This phone call from San Diego police and the suspicions surrounding Raymond and his life gave Nesbitt the momentum he needed to really start the investigation again. Raymond cut those people up and he learned how to do it from Mike and Dorothy. Raymond was not a suspect into Marie's disappearance, but his adopted parents were. The house where they all lived as Raymond grew up suspiciously burned down in the 80s. By 1996, there was a double-wide trailer on the property. Raymond Rogers was the legal owner of the property, which was signed over to him by his parents, Michael and Dorothy Rogers, as we talked about in the previous episode. This house was not officially the last place Marie Watson was seen alive. After all, it was Dorothy's story that Marie got into a car with a strange man and drove away. But there's a different story, and that's the story that Marie's daughter Sarah told investigators years later, a story that makes the Rogers property the place to look for the remains of Marie Watson. What Sarah told investigators about the last time she saw her mother, she also told to a local news station in 1996 when the Raymond story broke. In the footage, Sarah describes seeing her mother's lifeless body being carried by Michael in the Rogers home while Sarah was still a foster child. There was blood on her forehead, and her hair was hanging down and one of her arms was hanging limply as if maybe it was broken. Sarah says that she then saw Michael shove her mother's body into a false back shelf where they kept guns and drugs. Later that same night, Sarah described seeing Michael and Dorothy along with two unknown men cutting her mother up and disposing of her body. I believe they were cutting her corpse and feeding it to the pigs. And it is just too, it, it seems unreal to me, but what I see in my mind tells me it happened. And a, a six-year-old child does not make this up. I blamed myself because I, because Dorothy had told me if anybody ever tried to take me away that she would kill him. And my mom was dead. Dorothy and Mike were involved in satanic activity. And I think that by the point where my mother came into the picture, they had such a little regard for life that something that bizarre and something that horrific was run-of-the-mill daily things for them. I know that Dorothy and Mike killed my mother. And whether they are convicted or not, no one will ever convince me that those two evil people didn't kill my mother. Sarah wasn't the only one who saw Marie injured in the Rogers home around the time she went missing. Another adopted child, named Kevin, later told investigators that he saw Marie, badly hurt and tied up with something. And Marie's former husband, Jimmy Watson, told police that he knew where Marie was as well. 
In a 1996 interview nearby to the Rogers residence, Jimmy speaks to a reporter. I wanted to play a clip of him here, but he speaks quickly and in a low, difficult to understand mumble. You can see the baby blue double white trailer in the background as Jimmy speaks, sitting atop a concrete slab the likes of which I had never seen before. The concrete slab itself is not one but two large blocks that elevate the trailer in an odd way. It just doesn't look right. It looks too high up, artificially tall. And maybe, because I know so much about this story, it looks like something someone built to hide something. That's what Emmett locals thought, too. In fact, the Marie Watson case was local lore since it had happened in 1977, with people in Emmett telling tales of the woman buried on the Rogers property beneath the concrete slabs. And the owner of that trailer? Raymond Rogers, now sitting in jail awaiting trial for three murders. Though Dorothy was still living there, Raymond was the legal owner. Putting all of these things together, Sarah's eyewitness account, local stories that Marie was buried there, and the fact that a serial killer owned that property, finally, after 19 years, gave detectives enough probable cause to obtain and execute a search warrant, specifically looking for evidence of Marie Watson's remains. Rumors about what's buried in the foundation of the old Rogers foster home have been circulating Emmett for 19 years. They are not going to find no bones. Gem County detectives believe there are bones buried under the home. The bones of Marie Ann Watson. The female voice you heard there was Dorothy Rogers, who is still living in the trailer. She had been there since the 80s, and in 1996, this story was national news and was huge back in Idaho. In the footage, Dorothy is volatile toward the media and police, but to be fair, her adopted son, who she was very close to, had just been arrested for murder, and now, local police and the FBI were about to dig up her house, meaning she would have to go somewhere, evicted for 10 days, the length of the warrant. Dorothy. It's hard to describe her. Members of the local media aren't delicate with her and about her relationship with Marie, sometimes flat out accusing her of being guilty of Marie's murder. Did you kill Marie? No, did you? I'm tired of people telling me I did. If I'm being honest, from all that I had heard of Michael and Dorothy, I was intimidated by the prospect of talking with either of them, if not a little afraid of what they are capable of. I didn't want them to know who I am, which seems more than a little paranoid looking back. I mean... Both are in their 70s now and are spread out across Idaho. No real threat to me here in Boise. But the more I wrote and learned about the Marie Watson case, the more I had to be aware of myself and my role in this story and be aware of what information I had of myself out in the world. I'd never had to worry about that before. When I spoke to Nesbitt, he urged me to stay away from both Michael and Dorothy as I did my investigation on this story. I'm going to tell you that Mike and Dorothy are dangerous and they're volatile and they're unpredictable. Okay. When I interviewed Dorothy, she 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 lost control of her temper and she tried to stab me with a pencil in the interview. Whoa. Okay, good to know. Despite warnings from Nesbitt, I knew that I would have to talk to some people who maybe scared me. And the first person on that list was Dorothy Rogers. After months of avoiding what I knew to be inevitable, I found Dorothy's number. I called it and she answered. Hello? Hi, I'm looking for Dorothy Rogers. You got me, and what are you selling? Dorothy and I spoke for two hours. A lot of this phone call I did not understand. She told a lot of stories that I had no reference for. She was emotional at times. One minute she liked me, calling me sweetheart, and the next she yelled at me for not knowing what I was talking about. Talking with her was hard because I never really knew what to say or when to interject, or if I should just let her talk, which is what mostly ended up happening. My goal in talking to her was just to hear from her the Marie Watson story as best as she could remember it, and to ask her if the rumors surrounding her, the child abuse, Satanism, if they had any truth to them. Doing a story on the disappearance of Marie Ann Watson, and I was just hoping if you had a few minutes to talk about it, or if you would be interested in that. You know something? Uh, Who are you working for? Um, I'm not working for anyone. I'm just I'm just telling a story, basically, and I'm trying to cover all my bases and be fair. Hey, do you want the honest truth? 
Yeah, absolutely. Okay. The first thing Dorothy spoke about, as best as I could connect the stories, was about how she became an adoptive foster mother to so many children throughout her life. She describes how she couldn't have kids of her own, and so she asked God to give her children who needed love. I, I was upset, and I was thinking about killing myself because I lost my third baby. And my husband told me, oh, little things like that don't matter. So I just took a whole damn bottle of pills and decided, God, I'm going home. It didn't go on. Somebody had a child or something that they couldn't take care of. And they'd bring right. it to me. Right. God filled my arms. And I had as high as 16 and 18 kids in that little tiny trailer house. And that's the kind of children I was taken in. Right. And why? Because if I was doing to you, others you could have them do unto you. If, if, if I was hurting like that, I would want somebody to love me. And then even if it was, right. even if it wasn't in a dumb old trailer house. So far, this wasn't sounding like the Satanist I had heard so much about from Nesbitt. Dorothy went on to describe her religious beliefs and her relationship with God. Are you religious, Dorothy? What do you want to call religious? God has been the only one that stood beside me, and I've been... You're very religious. I, I feel like people have said... Oh, I love God. Yeah, Almighty, yeah. I ain't got no religion. I'm, I'm living... God, yeah. God's helped me. Though many people in this story alleged that Dorothy practiced Satanism, she told me that it was actually Marie that was responsible for bringing Satanism into their lives. Later on, she told me that she had been in devil worship. Marie was. Marie got into devil worship trying to get away from being a... They tried to raise her religious to make sure everybody thought she was religious. Yeah. And so she decided to defeat him that she would... Uh, she would worship Satan. He says, and she's out there in the shop arguing with the guys. Oh, if Satan can do anything, God can do. When Dorothy talked about Marie, she talked about her life as a prostitute and that Dorothy actually took care of her when she was sick. When she was dying. Was she? What, and she so? was really dying. Was it drugs? There's no two ways about it. I asked her, how close can you get to here? And I took all the little kids, and we drove over to Ontario, and she came in on the bus, and she couldn't even walk to the car. She was out there for two months, laying in the bed in the end of a little trailer that we were, we were all living in. And for one month, she lay there, and I didn't know whether she would live or die. Was she sick? Yes, yeah, I took tr- care of her. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I took care of her. When I got the chance... I asked for the story of the drive to Ontario, Oregon, the last time Marie was seen alive. Her story stayed the same all these years, that they went to Ontario, that a man in a black car driving behind them picked Marie up, and she was never seen again. Do you know where uh, Hamilton's Corner is? I do, yeah. Okay. Uh, Well, there was a filling station there. And she told me, can you stop at this filling station? I've got to run in there for a minute. You don't need to come. I'll be right back. Okay. I think I made a telephone call from there. And it was starting to snow. Yes. And uh, so we got her over to the uh, Ontario, and she said she didn't want to go in and talk to nobody. Was it Raymond's she car? Did... No. No, Raymond wasn't even here then. Okay. Yeah, cause... it was she Raymond's car. So... Uh, I was trying to drive, I was driving, and then I drive by, and well, she said, here, pull off on this road right here. Does she pull off? I, I pulled it there, and there, and then I noticed there was a car behind me. And I thought maybe he's going to help us or something, because she popped open the door. She said something to the man, and uh, she ran and jumped in his car. And that was it? And... They drove, I, and the, if they drove around me, now my, my car had slipped a little bit, or Raymond's car had slipped a little bit, and it, uh, it had kind of got stuck in some of the deeper snow on the side of the road. Okay. A little bit. But uh, I, I was able to get it out. But uh, by that time, they were gone. But they're that, that plate. 
was so different on the back of that car. I'd never seen one. And I can't remember the colors now, but I thought it was black and white. There's some fuzzy details in there for sure. Like she forgot they were driving Raymond's car that day. How she can forget the car they were driving that day, but remember these small details she mentions here is confusing to me. One thing that I noticed throughout the conversation was the tendency for Dorothy to offer up other theories for what could have happened to Marie. She does it in such an offhanded way that I didn't really notice it until I transcribed our talk later. She was a prostitute, and you know what happens to prostitutes? What? How well, she... they're pimp. Don't okay. get what he. If they don't get enough out there and do it right, then they beat the hell out of them. Okay. What do you think they do? Sometimes they kill them. I ask you, Murray, what are you going to do? She says, "Well, probably, well, probably they're going to they're going to somebody's going to shoot me and throw me in a ditch." Here, Dorothy suggests a pimp could have shot her, dumped her on the side of the road. Like she's just offering up possibilities that have nothing to do with herself or anyone in her family is being responsible for Marie's disappearance. For Dorothy, it just comes back to who Marie was. Like whatever happened to her, that it was Marie's fault. Dorothy tries to create a portrait of Marie, that Marie was a prostitute with a bad reputation who was irresponsible and reckless and didn't care about her kids. Because Marie had asked me, do you think and and could ever forgive me? If I took off and married, and if I took off and and married a, a different man, and and I helped raise his kids, I I told her no. She mentions this a few times in our conversation that Marie asked Dorothy flat out if her children could ever forgive her for leaving, and maybe she did say this at one point. But Marie was taking classes at Boise State, and she had two jobs. She had no reason to leave. Again, when talking to Dorothy, I had the hope that she would tell me something new. After all these years, that so much time had gone by, I don't know what I wanted from Dorothy. After all of my research, I think I just wanted her to give me something solid, something real. There were moments when I think I got as close to the truth as is possible in the Marie Watson story when I talked to Dorothy. Because honestly, I think Dorothy made up a story to cover for the person truly responsible, That's her husband, Michael Rogers. When we started to talk about Michael, that was the only time I felt like we were getting anywhere near the truth. When When did you meet Mike? How old were you, Dorothy? When did I meet Mike? When I was 12, 12, between 12 and 13 years old, I was picking cherries. And you said that he hurt you and Raymond in some way. How did he hurt you? Oh, lucky. I'm not even going to go into that. I'm not going to go into that at all. Well, that's okay. Uh, I mean, I yeah, I, I don't want to make you talk about anything you're fine. comfortable about. I got to tell the honest truth. Mike is criminally insane. You ask me who is the nicest human being I ever met, and I'm going to tell you Mike, Mike Rogers. I'm going to also tell you who is the worst human being I ever met, and I'm going to tell you it's Mike Rogers. Right. The only difference is you never know who you were talking to. Right, so he changed a lot. Oh. Was he abusive in any way to you? He he nearly killed me. Dorothy described to me her life with Michael and how he was physically abusive to her, sometimes nearly killing her. My head got broke. My broke my... the thing underneath my eye, yeah, he broke the other side. That's why. That's why I. I that's really why. I, why I left with him. Yeah, he he really hurt you. The doctor thought I would die. He told me don't go very far away. So if Mike is hurting you and he's hurting Raymond, could he have hurt well, Marie in any he, way? No, he wouldn't necessarily hurt Marie. Why not? I don't know. Like I told you, you know what? what? I'm sorry that, 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 that there was no human beings around to take care of him when he was little. I had heard so much about Dorothy while doing this story, her explosive temperament, how Detective Nesbitt thought that she was a dangerous Satanist. But when I spoke to her, I began to see her as someone who had been hurt. I don't know what happened with Marie Watson, and I don't think Dorothy is innocent. Dorothy knows more than she lets on. I know it. 
But Dorothy was frequently abused by men in her life, and it seems like she got the love she needed by adopting children. So it se- to me, it seems like Michael, I, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but it seems like Michael. He, he was capable of hurting someone. Do you think? He, did, yeah, because why? Because he's been hurt since the day he could talk. Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, it, it wasn't his fault. I don't think it's his it fault. It wasn't his fault that he he was that way. But here's here's what I think is I hear I hear that Mike hurt you and that he hurt people and I think about Marie and I think that he could have hurt Marie. Yeah, and you don't know how many people he helped. Yeah, I know he helped people. I I I, I don't doubt that you love him and that he helped people. No, he did help. He, he Yeah. I believe I know. I think you I think you really love him and I think he really helped people, but is it impossible to think that he hurt Marie in any way? No, well, I'll tell you what. He took a man, a full-grown man, at the mill and held him by his feet with his head just a few feet away from the thing. They were slicing logs, slabs of wood off the logs. Yes, he hurts people. Like I'm going to tell you, Mike was, if Michael could have got the right help. But he needed help. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why, that's why that doctor said that there would have been a good chance that if we had had children, they would have been just like him. Here, here's what the police say. The police say that Marie was trying to get her kids back, and so Michael hurt her and then got rid of her. No, not that I know of. He, uh, not that you know of? He likes, he likes whores. Would he want to hurt her? When he's in a bad mood, he likes whores. I did. Well, I, that's about the best I can tell you because. So, it's not right to think that Michael hurt her in any way. That's wrong. Well, not really, and let it. I I wouldn't know what he's capable of doing. I I couldn't hardly believe what was going on myself. And and then when he hit my head like that, I did not raise one hand. So he was ca- he was capable of hurting Marie. Good Lord, he's capable of ha- almost cutting a man's head off. And if you think, yeah. Are you af- Can I, Dorothy? Can I ask? Are you, are you afraid of Michael now? I love Michael. Was he? Are, are you afraid of him? Does he scare you now? I've never been no afraid of no man in the world. I've had brothers run around pointing a shotgun at me and telling they're going to kill, kill me. That's scary, Dorothy. That's really scary to me. No, it ain't. <laughs> that sounds terrifying. No, it ain't. No, it ain't. It's just life. A big part of Dorothy's life, long after Marie Watson went missing, was the arrest of her son Raymond in 1996. Dorothy and Raymond had always been close, and when Dorothy spoke of him, she was proud, sentimental even. I mean, it probably hurt Raymond to see you be hurt like that. Do you think it it bothered Raymond? Oh no, my son. My son didn't know it. Really? Really? Oh. That night that Mike did that to me, I, I, I know. I looked up there, and I had never seen Raymond in a, what do you call those real fancy suits? Uh-huh, like a tuxedo? A tuxedo! I've seen my, my son in a tuxedo, but I never, never, I never expected, he was in the light from the inside the house. Uh-huh. He was so beautiful. I'll never forget that. You really, I've never seen him in a tuxedo again. You really but, loved him. I do. In news footage, around the time the dig got started, Dorothy argued Raymond's innocence as police began their search for Marie Watson in Emmett. They come on this property pumping the septic tanks looking for pieces and parts of somebody. Now my son's mother of his baby is in pieces and parts. His friends are in pieces of parts. That's the connection. And my son didn't do it. Back in San Diego, things were not looking good for Raymond. 
Later, during his trial, his lawyers would try and argue his innocence, but with all the strong forensic evidence against him, like Beatrice's remains found in his storage unit, as well as his fingerprints inside latex gloves with her blood on them, the proof of his guilt seemed overwhelming. Jurors thought the same and sentenced him to death as a multiple murderer. He's been on death row at San Quentin ever since. You know, it'd be interesting now that this much time has passed. You know, Raymond's been in prison for 20 mm -hmm. years. Yeah. I wonder if he'd be willing to talk now. At Nesbitt's suggestion, I wrote Raymond. I had never written to anyone in prison before, let alone to someone on death row or a serial killer, no less. I wrote a handwritten letter, which seemed the most genuine, like I wanted him to know I was a real person. I wanted him to trust me. I wrote telling him who I was and that I was doing a story on the disappearance of Marie Watson. I asked him for any information that he had in her story, as well as any thoughts he had. I got a P.O. box for a return address, found out how to mail a letter to a prison, and sent the letter on its way. It took three weeks for a reply to come. My producer Daniel and I had been checking the P.O. box every day, waiting for anything. When we finally got a response, I was out of town visiting family, so Daniel sent me a photo of Raymond's response letter. Raymond Rogers has beautiful handwriting, clear from the envelope he sent. He uses a flowing, loopy cursive that somehow doesn't look feminine or precious. It seemed classy, elegant, a remnant of a time long past. The letter he wrote back was also handwritten, a little over two pages long, again with the gorgeous print. Right off the bat, he's unsure about me, writing, Who is Jordan? Do I know you? Did we go to school together? He also wants to know why I care about the Marie Watson case in the first place, writing, After 38 years, why are you interested in the resurrection of a case I know very little about? Is there a vested interest for you in this case? Are you contacting me as a proxy on behalf of one of Marie's relatives, or perhaps one of her children? Throughout the letter, he's very well-spoken, never substituting an easier word for a more eloquent one. It was clear to me that he wants to be seen as smart, which I'm sure I did in my letter too. Because of the things he's done, I found myself analyzing everything he wrote and the way he wrote it, adding special meaning to everything. In this first letter, he wants to know who I am more than anything else. He does speak about Marie, but claims that he doesn't remember much about her. He said that she was a beautiful older woman who was, quote, always kind and polite. The story he tells is identical to what Dorothy said about the drive to Ontario, that they borrowed his car that day. He remembered walking home three miles because no one was there to pick him up. When he arrived, his car was at the Rogers' home, quote, as I opened the door, it reeked of stale cigarette smoke, something I abhorred, he wrote. Mom said that Marie smoked in my car just to mess with me. The story after that is the same story Dorothy told. The man picked her up and she was gone. He ends by saying he's suspicious of my story and me, but if I had further questions, to please write. I did have more questions, and I decided that I needed to just be out with it. All of my questions about Satanism, child abuse, all of the crazy allegations against his foster parents. He wrote back, type this time, five pages. It was the same as when I talked to Dorothy. I think I held some hope throughout my correspondence with Raymond that I might be the one that he actually confessed to or admitted some clue that led to the next big break in the case. Something I could deliver to Nesbitt that would give him something. I'll spoil it for you, that didn't happen. What did happen was a complete denial, an exasperation of the allegations surrounding his family. No, those stories are not true, Raymond claims of Satanism. He continues, To the contrary, the Rogers, especially Dorothy and her side of the family, were very religious. Living an austere, almost Mennonite existence with strict convictions, there was no creepy dancing, singing, or sprinkling of blood, or saying some cryptic mantra. He also denies experiencing any physical abuse or witnessing any sexual abuse. He wrote, As for physical abuse, it was back in the time where the belt or willow was wielded for discipline. Nowadays, people would consider this abuse. Was I abused? No. He also said that the sexual abuse that his adopted father Michael was charged with, the rape of his adopted sister Kathleen, didn't actually happen. 
quote, no one believed it was true and were shocked when Michael pled guilty so as to not drag the family through a court trial and into the public eye. I later asked Kathleen why she accused Mike of such horrible acts, and she told me directly that she just wanted to get out of the household and that was the only way possible, end quote. In this second letter, I notice how fiercely loyal he is to his family, even now, after being separated from them for at least 20 years. Nesbitt described that other Rogers children still defend their parents too. Is Raymond defending his parents here because everything, every rumor, the sexual abuse, the stories of satanic rituals and child abuse, all of it, isn't true? Everything was just a rumor surrounding the Rogers? I admit, I find this hard to believe. Nesbitt seems to think that the reason Raymond defends his family so strongly is something akin to Stockholm Syndrome, or that Raymond is protecting himself. Raymond wasn't a suspect in Marie Watson's disappearance, and the warrant on the property was directly going after Mike and Dorothy. Nesbitt thinks that Raymond could have been involved in Marie's disappearance more than he lets on, and doesn't want to incriminate himself further, which I also find hard to believe, considering he's sitting on death row. The only thing that seems real to me is that the truth must be somewhere in the middle, somewhere between Raymond and Nesbitt. One thing I noticed in both of the letters I received from Raymond is how, while never blaming his adopted family for anything, he often blames the victim. This is what he had to offer about Marie, that rather than being someone who went missing or was murdered, Marie lived a reckless life, that she didn't care about her children, that her children were just used to her taking off. In our last episode, we talked about how it seemed like, around the time she went missing, that Marie was trying to get her life back in order. Raymond wrote that this was all an act, quote, Regarding Marie's children, do you even know their names? Did you know that there was virtually no interest in her children because Marie was always running off with strangers or partying somewhere for several days, leaving the children abandoned? I don't blame Marie for her wild, carefree ways. I understand her wanting a bit of freedom and excitement away from obligations while being an attractive, single, 20-something woman looking for a good time. But when children are involved, you have to prioritize when to go out and play or when to come home to stay. End quote. This part of the letter is strange to me because it's like he's chiding Marie in retrospect, someone he, in his first letter, said that he had little to no interaction with. It's like he's reciting a speech that's been drilled into him. So, according to Raymond, there was no satanic activity, there was no abuse other than a spanking now and then, and both Kathleen and Marie were at fault for whatever happened to them. He has no sympathy for Marie, and doesn't offer any suggestions for what could have happened to her, except that she took off, because that's who she was at the time. I guess I supposed, when writing him, that because he's in jail for the rest of his life, he might be willing to show some empathy for Marie, and perhaps share what he went through living with the Rogers. I was disappointed, but what could I have expected from a convicted serial killer? But if what Raymond writes is true, where is she? She never turns up after 38 years? Is it truly possible that she just started a new life, left her children, all of her stuff, her car, her husband, and her old life behind? Detectives argued no. Raymond cut those people up. And he learned how to do it from Mike and Dorothy. And this connection, that Raymond grew up to perpetrate similar horrors that he saw as a child, is what led to the dig on the Rogers property, looking for the remains of Marie Watson. Raymond, in his letters, argued that the dig on the property was highly illegal. Did my parents kill Marie? Raymond wrote in his second and final letter to me. Common sense and logical deduction tell me no, they did not. Only due to some illegal maneuverings by the sheriff's department and other law enforcement agencies, they were remarkably successful in justifying the excavation of the property in Emmett. Anyone with a decent lawyer would have put a stop to it because there was no actual probable cause. Things moved quickly after Raymond was arrested. Nesbitt spearheaded the dig, which began in June of 1996, just three months after Raymond was arrested. Detectives had 10 days, and an extensive dig and excavation began. The first thing Nesbitt did was use ground-penetrating radar to detect any abnormalities under the concrete foundation of the trailer. 
This meant removing the entire trailer from its foundation. Sheriff John of Emmett described this process. They'll compile their findings and on the graph and chart it out, and then we'll, uh, we'll know what we've got. If we've got any abnormalities here, they'll mark it, and then we'll excavate it and see what we've got below there. But first, detectives began their dig in the pig pen, where Sarah said she saw Mike and Dorothy cut up her mother's body with a saw and then feed it to the pigs. The search on this area of the property was slow going and little was found. Local news covered this dig extensively. For the 10-day length of the warrant, the story of the dig led the news each night. Nesbitt had the FBI, he had archaeologists and search dogs on site, and he had the full backing and support of the Gem County Sheriff's Office. All eyes in Idaho were on him, and he knew it. And then, after only a few days, they found something. It could be a big break in the case of a woman missing for 19 years. It took an entire day of digging, but Jim County investigators may finally have the evidence they need to solve the case of Marie Watson. New Center 7's Heidi Bodine reports. This green t-shirt is the gem investigators were hoping to find. They say for some reason, it was preserved very well beneath the foundation of the Rogers mobile home. The find came late in the day, right after they scooped up a bone. The ground penetrating radar pointed out several areas that had, as they're referred to, abnormalities. The news made a lot of this. It was breaking news that they had found a piece of green shirt and a bone fragment that appeared to be sawed off, which was relevant because Sarah claimed that she saw the Rogers dismember her mother with a saw before feeding her to the pigs. In addition, the green shirt they found had a red substance, which could have been blood. It was big news in the story. But what wasn't reported at the time was there wasn't just one bone found. There were hundreds, maybe even thousands of bones underneath that concrete slab. Remember, the original house where all of this took place burned down in the 80s. I asked Raymond about this when I wrote him. He owned and lived at the house when it burned down. He wrote, quote, I was out drinking beer one night, and when I came back home early the next morning, all that remained of a two-story split-level 10-room house was a small pile of smoldering ashes. I was devastated, in complete disbelief and shock. Later, it was determined to be an act of arson. Some believed it was sympathizers of Marie wanting to gain access to the concrete foundation, and their twisted belief that Marie might be buried underneath or somehow within the walls of the house. End quote. In the original house, it was described by both Dorothy and Raymond that there was an open pit they used for butchering. In this pit, they would throw unused animal parts. There were even buckets of blood by the open pit in the home, which I read about in Emmett's Messenger Index. Dorothy's sister Hazel spoke to them, saying, quote, That butchering thing, all of us do that. Probably 10% of Gem County does that. And as for buckets of blood, I would assume that would probably be the liver. Take it out and wash it and put it in cold water to get all the blood out of it. End quote. I couldn't help but think back to what Sarah said about the buckets of blood being poured on little boys. She was partly right. There were buckets of blood in the house. But according to Raymond, it was for food, writing, We were people of the earth, hunting, fishing, farming, butchering our own game and livestock. We killed, butchered, and packed our own freezers to provide sustenance for ourselves and others. Most people did it back then. It was nothing special or secretive, just a way of life. I'm sure many still do." End quote. I had never heard of this practice before, and naturally, it struck me as odd. I asked Nesbitt if it was common practice to have an open pit inside your house. Nesbitt said no. But based on what I knew of the home, they were doing live uh, sacrificing and live butchering inside the home. And there was an open pit in there, but they would butcher their animals inside the home wow. and then just throw everything in that pit, in an open pit in the kitchen. Uh, it's sure, certainly odd, not even butchers butcher animals in their home. For Nesbitt, this open pit pointed again to Satanism. It was for sacrificing, not for butchering animals for food. And what he found underneath the house, it was stranger than he could have ever imagined. And we unearthed all those bones underneath that house, yeah. including a monkey. I mean, we thought it was a baby skull Whoa. and it was a monkey. That's right. They even found monkey bones, which they initially thought were a child's bones. Daniel and I were confused. When we found the monkey, we thought it was a baby. But it turned out to be, a, you know, I thought it was a monkey because I'm not an anthropologist. But as soon as he thought, he goes, 
Yeah, well, that's an ape of some sort. So, how would they get a monkey? Like that seems. Well, yes, that. What ha- what was happening was in that home, in that creepy house, they had an open pit in the kitchen, and they were doing live butchering and throwing the bones in the open pit in the kitchen. Right. But, I mean, a monkey seems just hard to obtain. Like, if I think today, yeah. how am I going to get a monkey? I, I, you know, I have, would have no idea. But what they were, were in the underworld. Mm. Right. And right. so in the underworld, in their connection through the underworld, things travel through, you know, exotic snakes, exotic pets, monkeys. So Nesbitt had bones and lots of them. The sawed-off bone, however, seemed the most human in appearance, but to be fair, they had so many bones that could have been human that it was like the cliché needle in a haystack. Nesbitt described how they basically had to choose the most human-looking bones and send those off for testing. They did this, along with the green t-shirt, and the news cycle of the Marie Watson dig reached fever pitch. Everyone held their breath. Reporters, detectives, even Sarah, who was flown in during the dig. Everyone involved, they just waited for the results. The dig continued until the warrant ended, looking for and gathering as much evidence as they could find. And then... Mike and Dorothy Rogers can expect to be arrested for the 19-year-old murder of Marie Watson. It was a long, frustrating search, and now investigators say that they do not need bones to prove that Mike and Dorothy Rogers murdered Marie Watson. It's a change that's so small, it's difficult to notice. The news report starts strong, saying Mike and Dorothy should expect to be arrested, and then... Suddenly the bones go from being the center of the investigation to unnecessary. That's because the results were not what detectives were hoping for. So the bones that you dug up under the house, everything I read, it seemed it said they were inconclusive. What does that mean? I guess I... We were ha- looking for right. human, and so... The ones that we could identify through anthropology, mm-hmm. you know, we would we were logging all the bones in evidence, and then the ones that they could not identify as animal or human are just inconclusive. We don't know what they are. They found that T-shirt. Did the teacher ha- did it have blood on it? Uh, there was stains on it that appeared to be blood, but the problem was being in that alkali dirt out there for so long. They couldn't get any DNA. They couldn't determine what it was. Inconclusive doesn't mean not human. It just means that the bones weren't able to be proven as such. And with that, despite Sarah's testimony of witnessing her mother's dismemberment, despite the Dorothy story of the last time she saw Marie having many, many inconsistencies, the police placed the trailer back on the concrete foundation. Dorothy came back to a torn up home and that was it. It was over. Of this crucial moment, Raymond wrote in his second letter, After all the media frenzy, what did they find of relevance? Nothing. All caps. Which is not exactly true, but it was true enough. And while Nesbitt might have hoped that he didn't need Bones to pursue a case against the Rogers, no charges were ever brought against Mike or Dorothy for the disappearance of Marie Watson. I guess, yeah, I have obviously a very basic understanding of forensics in that way, but... So I I guess I envisioned breaking open a bone and getting marrow out. Was that just not present or there wasn't enough? At the time, you know, 21 years ago, they didn't do the things that they can do now. Now they can take that and get DNA and determine whether it's human or animal DNA. Right. But the cost now for the state to do that versus, you know, what if you're trying to prove something, okay, we'll do it. If it's if it's nothing you know, we can't determine one way or another. Right. We're not going to spend that kind of money right. to, de- to determine that it's nothing. Daniel and I wondered about this. How could it be that after everything Nesbitt did, the warrant, the dig, the gathering of bones, how could it all just add up to nothing? And how could it be that money, or lack of it, prevents new tests on evidence which could implicate the Rogers in the death of Marie Watson? Like, if it were to be tested again today, would it be possible for them to find things that they didn't have access to then? You know, it's highly likely. I mean, we've advanced a long way since 96. Right. And uh, it's possible that that they could. It's possible that they could find a lot of things. But I don't know what they have for her specifically. But, yeah, it's possible. I, I don't doubt it a bit. 
So if we, I guess the question we had this was... a crazy question, but... <laughs> <laughs> like, so let's say we show up in Gem County and we have, this is not true, but pretend that we have a bunch of money and we say we want to test the Marie Watson stuff. Would they do it? How does that work? Well... <laughs> we want to we want to know what those test results are, and you made it yeah. sound like that it was a, a financial issue. If it wasn't a financial issue, could they be tested? I think it. Well, I meant by the financial issue. I think it was testing each and every bone that we we found, like bags and bags and bags of bones underneath that house, and uh, they what we had was the the anthropologist was out there. And the things that the most closely resemble a possible human bone, they sent those off to be tested. And then, and then all of the bones. I mean, for them to go through and test DNA on all those bones, the problem is, is they would have to sit down, and every you know, a forensic scientist would have to determine, you know, what this bone is, because they they would not do DNA on three bags or four bags right. of bones. There's, there's hundreds of bones. Mike and Dorothy Rogers have never been charged in connection with the disappearance of Marie Watson. Raymond Rogers remains on death row at San Quentin Prison in California. He lost all appeals on his case. Detective Nesbitt now works for the Idaho State Police and remains listed as lead investigator on the Marie Watson case. To this day, Marie Ann Watson remains missing. If you have any information on this case, please contact the Gem County Sheriff's Department. Contact information is on our website at thinairpodcast.com. A huge thank you to Tom Nesbitt for talking with us more than once and fielding our many questions. A big thank you also to the Idaho State Archives, an amazing resource for all things historic in Idaho. Music for this episode provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Their music can be listened to and downloaded at blue.sessions.bandcamp.com. This episode also featured music by Chris Zabriskie. For download links, visit his website at chriszabriskie.com. And while you're at it, visit our website at thinairpodcast.com for links to these musicians and much more. Thin Air is an independently financed, produced, and published podcast. We depend on support by listeners like you. If you like what you hear and you want to hear more, please donate at our Patreon page. The address is patreon.com forward slash thin air podcast. Donation links are located at our website in the upper right corner. Also, if you're an iTunes listener, please rate and subscribe. Your feedback is valuable to our success and helps us to reach more listeners. If you'd like to get more involved with our podcast, check us out on social media. We're on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash thin air podcast and on Twitter at thin air podcast. Join us again in two weeks when Daniel begins a new missing persons investigation.